People don't understand how your how your brain changes when you don't 100%. have debt. You are not the same person when you have debt and when you don't. I when I don't it. owe nobody. <laughs> I'll Let me take tell it a you step something. further. I'll take it a step further. We were talking about this the other day. Becoming a millionaire as an index fund investor has little to do with your intelligence or your ability to work hard or do any of those things, right? It's purely just a matter and a function of time. Cool. All right. Um, we're gonna make a coffee spice rub for the ribeye. Awesome. Yeah. And so you do make our coffee every single day. I and do. so you're probably the best person to grind the coffee. Chili powder, ground cumin, smoked paprika, and coffee. What mistakes do you see most people making when they're applying their rub? Start from all the way up here because they've seen Salt Bay do it. Yeah. <laughs> and they're like doing this, and then, then you've got all this crap all over the place. So you really want to season like intentionally. We're going to make a sweet potato hash uh -huh. um, to go with our coffee rub. This feels very brunchy. This is like something I would order at a restaurant. Uh, we could throw an egg on it and call we it could, brunch. Yeah. That's pretty much all brunch is. <laughs> Um, dinner with an egg on top. Honestly, this is a bit of a symphony. You're trying to make sure that all the vegetables cook at the same time. All right, so this goes in the oven. Okay, all right, so I'm gonna flip. Beautiful. So you've got the caramelization of the sugar. But what you're really doing is flavoring Now it's time for the big reveal. I'm so excited. I feel like I might have hit medium, but we'll see. Wee the country part of me wants to put that between two pieces of bread and <laughs> make a sandwich out of it. <laughs> That's beautiful. Ready? Sure. Refill? Uh, yes. That was real good. That was good. See, now you understand why steak is king. What I notice about things like that is just the importance of being thoughtful. Like, you have to be thoughtful when you're making a steak. Yeah, it's not passive. You, no, you gotta slow down. Yeah. You gotta really try to... You gotta listen to the potatoes. You gotta listen to the potatoes. You gotta listen to the steak. You gotta feel you it out. To the steak. You gotta give it time to just relax. It's like a metaphor for marriage. <laughs> <laughs> or for investing. Mm. Tell me more. <laughs> not as far as that. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Cheers. Cheers to you. Here's to another delicious meal. Mm -hmm. So, what did you want to talk about? Um, I want to talk about what has, interestingly enough, become one of my least favorite subjects. <laughs> what? Investing. Really? Yeah. Why is it your least favorite subject? Um, I think because it's it's like a never ending conversation. Yes. You know, like I think there are always people asking for like, what should I do? Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, insert one point of view, insert another rule of thumb, and then you end up in this never ending back and forth. It's like a, it's like a Twitter beef, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> or like a group chat, it just never ends. A there's, race with no finish line. Th there's no, and, and arguably no point. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, because there's always going to be a competing point of view. If you're following the traditional, and by tradition, I'm referring to like rules of finance, they're gonna say like basically math wins, right? The, the answer that gives you the highest degree of return is always going to be the right answer. You always aim for that. It's just so silly. 
Like, <laughs> it's just so silly. Like, it's such a, a, a dominant base narrative that doesn't consider anybody who has not been on the right side of rational math. Yeah. Because they either were underpaid or not paid at all yeah. or have different competing objectives for their life than to just max out on profit. Like Correct. it's ridiculous. Correct. Yeah, it's this, this idea that decisions, that human beings are rational beings, right? That we're always going to make the decision. It was like, well, you're going to do the thing that is predicted, yeah. right? To give you the highest degree of return. It's like, well, no, not always. If you think about even the last time we were together, and we were here with my mom, right? Like she has admittedly made tons of decisions, some good, some bad, but they're not always based on, you know, what's the most rational thing to do, right? Yeah. I mean, it's like, I live in a country and I'm gonna go move and uproot myself and go to another country. Like you could argue that there's nothing rational, obviously depending on the situation, there's nothing rational about going to a place where you don't know anyone. Yeah. You know what I mean? You don't know if you're going to have a place to sleep in that night. But she I, be believes she I believe yeah. I believe that what I'm doing is the right decision for me based on the information that I have. And I'm therefore going to go off and make this decision. And I think, you know, long winded way of sort of getting back to the topic of conversation around investing, but that's. That's the idea. You've got a decision. You're going to spend the money that you have today or you're going to invest that money into something that you believe will multiply your money dot, 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 to the highest degree. There's a lot of beliefs in play that you have to think about when you're considering whether to invest or not. You have to establish a belief around your income. Then you have to establish a belief around your spending. And then the hardest part, which is I think what gets people caught up with investing, is you have to establish a belief about the future. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people have a hard time envisioning a future self. There's a looming belief that the future is just not gonna exist. Mm -hmm. Like the world is burning, it's gonna fall apart, we're all gonna die, things are horrible. Like, And so it's hard to imagine that you would invest in the person that you're gonna be, or the yeah. life that you're gonna live, or the world that you're gonna live in. I don't venture into that part of the internet. <laughs> at all um i know that exists because like you know the screw it is all going to hell in a handbasket yeah. anyway i'm gonna live today um yeah it's yolo there was a whole drake song about it yeah. you only live once that's the model nigga yolo and we bought it every day i don't <laughs> i don't i don't venture into that corner of the dark web <laughs> it's not the dark web when you look at are you saving do you have a plan for retirement have you thought about your life 10 years from now there's absolutely no thought and like there's a disconnect there where it's like, okay, maybe if I say it and I describe it that way, you don't see yourself in it, but I can look at your actions and know that this is a pattern of thought that is operating unconsciously, subconsciously, whatever you want to call it, because you're not actually serving that person. Like you're only serving the impulses you feel today, in the minute, in the hour, and that is killing your finances. Yeah. <laughs> you know, whenever like seasoned cooks, use terms like a pinch or just a scotch, a touch. a touch, a tad. It's like, what's the unit of measurement? So with things I know, like no, no, I don't need no specifics because I already know what I'm doing. Like what? Life. See, <laughs> tell me about your journey to investing, right? Like, oh my God. Obviously a, a truncated version of your, your journey. Because I mean, I know you didn't always invest like you do now. No, I didn't start investing until I was 27, 28, late 20s. I was already 10 years into my career, or 10 years, not into my career, but 10 years into working before I even considered investing and probably like 13 years into my career before I actually started investing. And do you remember your first investment or like what your strategy was for investing? Strategies uh, loosely, like what was yeah. the, what were the beliefs? Um, what were your beliefs about investing when you started? I had several. So the way that I was pressured <laughs> into investing, I'm not even gonna say pressured, but convinced, finally convinced Why was- <laughs> Was it a family member? <laughs> like No, it was just, I was in uh, a lot of debt and mm -hmm. I, ra I would rather have things than to start thinking about my retirement, which I had put off at 26, 27, mm -hmm. late 20s you're still thinking of retirement as something that happens when you're like 65, 70. It yeah. seems so far away and I thought I had enough time to do it when I felt like it. 
Yeah. And so this was before the fire movement, obviously, and, and before you, but I just felt like I had time. And it wasn't until like I realized what the 401k match was and how little it would impact my paycheck. Like my dad sent me down and did the math and he's like, you're talking about, you know, 10 or 20 or $30, which you're already giving to the government. Like this is, you know, learning what tax deferred was. So that's what got me started in investing, was investing in my employer-sponsored 401k to get the match. Yeah. And because it didn't affect my paycheck a ton, it felt like that was a small thing to feel good about investing. Yeah. All of the other types of investing, I had no idea about, and I assumed I needed a financial advisor to do that, and so I got one. Yeah. Yeah, so my introduction to financing came similar. It was a recommendation for a financial advisor who was a family friend. Still is a family friend. Um, and, you know, great guy was a mentor to me in many ways for a long period of time. But as I started to learn more and more, I never thought about like what that really meant. And what that really meant was I was taking the part of my brain that was responsible for my financial well-being, carving it out and handing it to someone to be responsible for making 100% of those decisions. Yeah. He would come back with a recommendation every now and then and it just, yep, because I have no idea. Like, exactly. yep, you know what yeah. you're talking, yep, okay. <laughs> Talk for two, three minutes and I would have no idea what he was talking about and it just nod in my head. And then after a while, I was like, this just doesn't feel right. You know what I mean? Like, because I don't do that with any other part of my life. Like, it's not, you know, while I have a, a doctor, yeah. you know what I mean? I'm, I still assume some responsibility yeah. over my my, my health, my physical health, my mental health, all of it. But for some reason, when it came to money, this whole thing that I was like working for, I was just like carving out a whole part of my brain and saying, yep, I don't know, I don't wanna know, that's why I pay him. Even though I didn't even know how he got paid. Yeah. I was just like, you know what, that's why I pay him to make all these mistakes. Um, and it's really fascinating, because as I've learned more, it's like, wait a second, like when I realized you didn't need to have a financial advisor, and that's not to say that you don't ever have to or that we won't ever. Or that you can't choose to have one. Right. But I thought it was mandatory. I thought it was like, someone needs to guide me. Yes. Even when I invested in my 401k at work, there was like a whole series of prompts as to how you select your portfolio, like aggressive, mild, medium, low risk. And it was like, if you don't know, well, here's a fun calculator. Yep. Enter in your goals. How much do you think you want at retirement? And yep. it's like, okay, well, we recommend this one. And I was like, bet. Yeah. Like, I had no idea. It was just like. You don't realize that that's marketing. I know. That's not financial, like, <laughs> advisory. Not advice. Yeah. No. It's, it's marketing. That's actually marketing. Yeah. It's like, how do you want to feel? Happy. <laughs> Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Happy. Uh, <laughs> Where do you see yourself in 60 years? On a yacht, bitch? Yeah. Like, right yeah. there? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I was invested in very expensive, actively managed funds that yeah. were guaranteeing, you know, 20, 30% returns for a really long time. It wasn't until I discovered the FIRE movement that taught me how to, one, learn about financial tools and products and the industry, right? You don't tend to think of it as an industry just like everything else is an industry, mm -hmm. but it is. So when I learned about it and then I went back through, I was like, God, it's like that Denzel gift. <laughs> like, God, I've been giving away my money for five years. Like yeah. it was, it was really eye opening. Like when I started learning about it and I started actually looking at my statements, you realize like you're watching the news and you hear on the news, and you're watching the stock tickers and you're watching the news, the journalists talk about the Dow Jones and is hitting How a new high. A and you don't feel anything because you're not connected to that. Connected but to that. when you understand how it works and the impact that it has on your life and everything else, it was like the matrix. It was like, whoa, I, I can see it all now. And it changed my relationship with work. It changed my relationship with investing and money, how I spent as a consumer, everything. It was a, it was a game changer. I was reading about the pandemic and like I'm really interested in how it's changing all of our behaviors. Yeah. And so I was reading this article where the writer was talking about having to have the pandemic talk with people mm -hmm. where you're trying to figure out what risks they've taken. Insinuation anxiety. Oh. So it's an anxiety that comes to you when you feel like you're insinuating that someone is not trustworthy. 
And so if I ask you to tell me all the places you've been before we agree to meet up for lunch, because I'm worried about exposure of, you know, coronavirus, I don't actually ask you because I'm afraid you're gonna think that I don't trust you. Mm -hmm. Or if we're walking down the street at the same time and I move over, or I wanna move over to give you the necessary six feet, I don't do it because I don't want you to think that I'm moving over because I don't trust you. It's yeah. just like, I'm just trying to not get corona. Yeah. So it's this whole, and it's a, it's a term that's been researched for a long time because researchers were trying to figure out why Americans take such bad advice. Yeah. And to go back to your point with doctors and, and even religious leaders or leaders in the community or politicians, the reason why you willingly take bad advice is because you don't want to insinuate that the person that you're talking to can't be trusted. Ah, oh, it smells good. Yeah? Does it smell like morning coffee? No, it actually smells like, um, <laughs> I don't want to say, it smells like tacos because of the cumin, but. <laughs> this is like a Southwest vibe. Yeah. I think that's good. Okay. Um, nope, that's good. All right, now it's time to season the steak. So this is ribeye, which I know we just did a video on filet. Yeah. One $60 tenderloin got me five filet mignons, this, 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 and this, mm -hmm. which apparently was news to a lot of people, so I'm really happy <laughs> about that. I'm gonna let this sit out on room temperature for a little bit, and that's gonna do a couple of things. One, the steak is going to um, come up to room temperature, uh, and when it does that, a lot of the seasoning that was on the outside is gonna seep into it a little bit more. If it was cold, there's almost like a barrier there, and it just sits on top of it, and then mm -hmm. it'll fall off. So, was I the person that introduced you to index funds? Yes. Okay. Yes, via the, the FIRE movement. So when I first got excited about investing, I wanted to be an active investor. Yes. I had spent all of my life doing things. Yes. Doing it, yes. you get a reward, you're first, you you're find, smart. yeah, you find the diamond in the rough, like I found, and so I'd spent all day like scouring the internet, reading about early technologies, AR, virtual reality, you know, Bitcoin, crypto. You gotta like, be ahead of the curve. I gotta be ahead of the curve. Sharper, like, the sharpest knife in the in the, oh man. In the chest. I was or deep in the is. Googles, like yep. deep in the Googles, trying to understand the world 10 years from now from like an engineer, yep. first thinking point yep. of view. I can tell you more about Tesla's battery than like anybody could. And so when you introduced me to indexing and I had to learn to just be a passive, Buy and hold, low, slow, like Warren Buffett, everything's fine, hippie investor. It was like a jolt to the system until I got them year one returns and it was like, oh. Game changer. Oh. Um, the alternative with indexing was like, or <laughs> you can pay pennies on the dollar, not even try to beat the, 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 the game, not even try to beat the system, not try to be 10 years, 15 years ahead of the curve, not be the expert that knows how to analyze all these stock charts and, and income statements and all of this stuff and just buy all of it. Yes. Yes. And you're gonna win. Of all the things that have happened since 1942, we've had, we've had uh, 14 presidents, seven Republicans, seven Democrats, we've had We've had world wars, we had 9-11, we had the Cuban Missile Crisis, we have, a, we have all kinds of things. The best single thing you could have done on March 11th, 1942, when I bought my first stock, was just buy an index fund. It's self-cleansing, it's sort of self-balancing, it, do, it does if its own thing. If there is a rock star, you still benefit. You, if there's a new entrant, yeah. you probably own a little bit of that. If one leaves, it's okay because it's likely replaced by yeah, another, another one. Yeah. You own all of it. You yeah. have a share of the global economy, so you don't have to really think about it. So long as you believe that the global economy will continue to exist within your lifetime, you own a slice of that pie. Yeah. That to me was such a relief, because going back to your point about wanting to be the expert, because that was, that was a barrier for me. It was like, where am I gonna find the time and the energy to 
be the expert in those things in addition to all the other stuff. And so for me, once I adopted indexing, not just as an investor, but you could argue like as a way of life, it was like freeing. It, it was, was like, oh my God, I don't have to think about it. And now I put all that energy into our business because yeah. I can actually control that. Yes. You know what I mean? And that was just... It was like a spiritual alignment. It really was. It really was. Like I struggled with it for a long time because yeah. I'm addicted to efforting like a yes. lot of like busybodies and perfectionists. But once I realized I could redirect it to the things that I can control. It wasn't until I stopped investing in my job self and more in my personal self and my entrepreneurial self that I started earning money outside of the, my traditional yeah. job. And I started comparing the effort required and the potential return, and, and actual return. I was like, so wait a second. If I wanted a $10,000 raise at the job, I would have to jump through hoops. I would have to kiss a lot of ass. I would have to do all of these things. I would have to stop being myself, or I could invest in real estate, or I could save money, invest my the money, invest those savings and put that to work and let that generate the raise that I was looking for. That was when I knew the jig was up because I would sit in these quarterly meetings where they're going over, you know, what they reported out to Wall Street mm -hmm. or what they reported to, you know, market analysts. And they would talk about all this growth and all these How billions well and blah. And like the question that I asked myself that changed the way that I thought about my corporate trajectory was, what are they doing with the profits? Mm -hmm. If it's not coming to the employees, if I still got my little 2% merit raise, which is not doing anything in terms of inflation, where is the rest of it going? I know we're building this new technology infrastructure. Okay, subtract $100 million. Yep. I know we yep. you know, invested in this new building in another region. Okay, subtract another $200 million. But there's still billions. Couple billion. Couple billion. Left over. Like two, three, four, five billion. Mm -hmm. 10 billion. Okay. <laughs> Which company are we talking about? <laughs> I remember doing that same math. Because yeah, you don't have that. to be a genius. It was no. like, I don't understand. The way that companies handle profit today to their detriment is they pass it to the shareholders. Mm -hmm. And so if I wanted my rightful raise, I needed to get off Glassdoor, get off Indeed, get off all these little sites that compare market research on people who have your job and their salary and what they should make and stop asking for a raise and actually invest in the companies that I believe in and get my raise that way. Whether I believe in our economic system or not. Like, to be clear, I think our economic system is very broken. Yeah. My personal strategy, my personal ideology is one where I put my mask on first yeah. and make sure my family eats and I don't outsource that to my employer who will very quickly trim headcount, cut wages, and do what they need to do to deliver the promise to shareholders. Which we've seen. Which we've seen. Time and time again. Child. Which blows my mind. This is why I got Why people. Child. <laughs> <laughs> like being debt free was one of the biggest sort of like oh things to get you there because it's hard to accept that as a truth when you still have debt, when you don't have debt and you can afford to take on that risk. And then when you reap the rewards from that risk, it's a game changer. You will never go back. People don't understand how your how your brain changes when you don't 100%. have debt. You are not the same person when you have debt and when you don't. And that's the hardest part to explain to people who are putting off paying their debt for other things, whatever that may be. Yeah. And I'm not saying it should be like one or the other, like you can invest while you have debt or you can, you know, do other things while you have debt. Yeah. But like to ignore your debt to wait for it to go away. And to have that means you are, it's, it's, you're, you're holding yourself back in, yeah. a, in, a, in a personal way. Yeah. It's not like your career won't progress. It's just your mind is completely different when you owe somebody versus when you don't. I'll when take, I don't owe nobody, <laughs> I'll take it a step up. further. I'll take it a step further. We were talking about this the other day, but even the idea of becoming a millionaire Right, like seems like a, and, and I say this knowing that it, it, it will likely rub some people the wrong way, but like the idea or that being a worthwhile goal seems silly. Once it you does. truly understand its inevitability, Stop. right? It's like, well, becoming a millionaire 
as an index fund investor has little to do with your intelligence or your ability to work hard or do any of those things, right? It's purely just a matter and a function of time. Yes. If you invest your money consistently over time, you will eventually become a millionaire. Yes. That's not a, like, that's not that's a goal. That's not a goal. Once you, know it, what I mean? once you understand its inevitability, it stops being right. a goal. Right. It, it is, it's natural for Correct. an economy as wealthy Correct. as ours Correct. that that is the case. Correct. Like, yeah. that's what happens. When you age, you will, yeah. your skin will your sag. Right, your your gray will, oh. your, your hair's. That's not where I was going with my metaphor. Well, I'm just saying, like, it's an inev it's inevitable. Yeah. Maybe, well, maybe, maybe not for you. You won't age a bit. I'm not going to age ever. I hate chopping sweet potatoes because yeah. they're so hard. They like are. you have to put your whole arm into it. Your what? Yeah. <laughs> um, I love hashes because they're so simple and easy. And this one's actually going to be really pretty because you've got all these colors going on. But mostly because they are really, really easy to make. They um, are. And you can eat them with almost anything. Like yeah. you can cover them with a chili, yep. you can put an egg on top, you can eat it cold. Not like cold, but like room temperature. Good. It's kind of versatile, like pizza. We're gonna make pizza in the next episode. Hey. Okay, perfect. There's a lot of talk about entrepreneurship and passive income and yeah. how easy and <laughs> Like it just happens, and you know, man, look at look at these receipts and look all at Mark that. Look at Mark Zuckerberg. Right, right. And it's like, yo, <laughs> you didn't go to college. It's a grind, man. It's a grind. It has its perks without question, but there, there are some great days, and there are some really, really low. But days. that's no different from being an employee, Correct. right? It's about what you believe. Right. If you believe that you can make it through the other side of those hard days and the grinding and that you will have your own back in that moment, then you keep going. Yeah. If you believe that an employer will take care of you more than you would take care of yourself, then you stay working. Like it's about the belief of who's going to take care of you in the end. Yeah. And I believe in believing, I believe in believing people mm. <laughs> the first time. They believe in themselves. <laughs> Best believe. The belief is the belief of the belief. <laughs> <laughs> I believe in believing people the first time they show themselves to you, right? Like there, there is grace. Do you though? <laughs> no, let's be fair. It took us years before we decided to walk away and the company showed itself, showed its ass yeah. several times. Yeah. It took us it took us a while. So I understand. But and I didn't believe for a long time I didn't believe that that was the company. Yeah. I believed that it was those people that did something wrong. They didn't deliver enough value. Mm. Their leadership didn't like it was a them thing. Yeah. That's why I was good and yeah. I was going to keep doing what I do and the company was going to keep rewarding me. And then in the last three to four years, you start seeing good people, and not, not that the other people weren't good, but you start seeing people that you do know work as hard as or harder than mm -hmm. you still being hurt by this system. And it's like, maybe I'm not special. You know what was another moment for me was learn, learning, it sounds nerdy, but like learning about the solo 401k. Mm. Like when you also realize that the government gives you every in incentive possible to be self-employed. It's like, it's okay. it's hard to fail this way. Okay, so this is, I know you're not like on the dark web, as you call it, AKA black Twitter. Yeah. But like on Twitter, there is a whole group of people who are like preaching this from the mountaintops. Dude. They're dubbed LLC Twitter, hey. and they're known for like shaming people. You remember how people used to shame people into getting passports yes. instead of Jordans? Oh, okay. So <laughs> or now, Jordans instead of whatever. Yeah. Like, you in Jordans, but you don't vote. You in line for Jordans, but you don't vote. You, you got, you know, chains, but you don't have a passport. So now LLC Twitter, as they're called, is basically doing that for people where it's like your stimulus check you should use to get an LLC. <laughs> like, mm. <laughs> that's, a, that's how they sound in my head. Okay. I say they like I'm not part of them because no one recognizes me as part of them, but I love you. I'm <laughs> You're not gonna out me as LLC Twitter. My point was a lot of people don't understand the incentives that the US government and tax system gives self-employed people. Oh my God. And 
it has been one of the biggest ahas for me. Like you said, solo 401k as if like everybody knows about it. But when I got my hair braided a couple of weeks ago, the lady who braided my hair, I was telling her you need to get, you know, an LLC because the money that you are making from this hobby that you're doing while you're furloughed could be invested tax-free and, you know, used later in life. And she was like, what? You compare the ability to save tax-free $57,000 with what you could at your max as an employee, which is like 19.5, I believe. Mm -hmm. It's like that on top of being able to write off business expenses, for me, was a complete game changer. And it was like, you and know what? And the you ability have... to put a premium on your time. Absolutely. Yeah. You have every incentive in the world, well, in the country, <laughs> to be an entrepreneur, yeah. to earn income on your own. It's the quality of income earned by yourself that's far better. And I, you know, I just want more people to fall out of love with the allure of a six-figure job. Like, it's not to say that everyone should be or even can be an entrepreneur, but I do want more people to understand that it is an option and it is available and the, there are advantages to it that I think are worthy of consideration. The pan get hot, add some oil, that's good. Move it around with some purpose so that each piece is in contact with the bottom of the pan. Okay, and then I'm just gonna add a little dusting of that. That'll help bring the flavors together. Do you think that entrepreneurship is something that's for some people and not for others? The way to look at it is that today, given this economy, there is little choice left, mm -hmm. right? So it's not even about whether or not you can be. You could argue that it's, it is a skill set that is necessary for survival, yeah. you know what I mean? Because the world has changed around us. And so you have to have built systems or own equity in systems that generate income today. You can't afford to not be an entrepreneur. You can't, you have to, yeah. because this idea of, of just being employed and continuing to be employed for years is not, is not sustainable. And corporate America has proven to you that that's not what they want. In fact, that's not their job. Nope. Their job is not to keep you employed. Nope. It's to maximize profits, which is either gonna come by growing revenue or lowering expenses. And if you get in the way of lowering expenses, or if you haven't continued to sharpen your saw that can help them increase revenue, then you're just, you, you, you're gonna be replaced. Yeah, I think about this in my head a lot because that's the number one pushback that we yeah. get is everybody can't be a business owner. Everybody can't be an entrepreneur. I love that like my my defensive voice is <laughs> all sexy. in the same tone. Like, yeah. Everybody can't be well, an entrepreneur. Because really <laughs> cool. y'all all crazy. Whatever. <laughs> no, but everybody pushes back and they're like, everybody can't be an entrepreneur. Everybody can't be a business owner. Yeah. And it's like, actually, you can. You can. I, I see it as the manifestation of capitalism at its finest, right? It's it's the, the truest. Words. Well, I'm just saying it's the truest form of it, right? I think we, we talk about it all the time, this idea of free enterprise. And what the internet has done is it has democratized that and made yes. it available for everyone. You've got a mobile phone. You can do everything that we're talking about. You can invest right now. You can start a business. You can start selling things. You can start promoting that business. You can do all of those things from yeah. your phone, yes. right? Um, and into your point, start earning money 365 days a year, which going back to our conversation about investing is, is at the heart of how we're building wealth. It's this yes. idea that I've got enough shares working for me, speaking every single language, owned in every single industry that you can think of via index fund investing. And on top of that, we have entered into a niche and built out a brand and a business that has allowed us to earn you. <laughs> so the steak has been sitting at room temperature. Um, this is one of my favorite smells, melted butter. I'm really excited about this. This was like 
one of my dream meals. I would always see this on television, uh, like Bobby Flay or something like that would do something. And I was like, when I, when I get rich, I'm gonna make a coffee rub steak. Okay, all right, so I'm gonna flip. Beautiful. If you're trying to get a steak perfect, you don't cook it to its perfect state. Right. You cook it to right before it's done. Yeah. You just literally let it rest. I fully understand the, the desire for quick money. My, my brain works the same way where I am constantly looking for validation or certainty in a decision that I've made. And day trading gives you that every day. You know if your investment was a good one or a bad one, a good one or a bad one. And it becomes, it's just like any other dopamine hit. It becomes yeah. something that your brain looks forward to. If you wanna actively trade with a portion of your money, you should treat it like any other yep. subset of your budget where you're not sure what the outcome is gonna be. No investment is put money in, get money out. But with trading, which is particularly risky, and especially if you're doing it through an app that is known to have hairline margins where a matter of seconds makes a difference between you making money or losing money and the app crashes quite a bit, that's a bit of a risk that you need to factor into like how much money you're willing to put in through, you know, through that, yeah. through that means. Look, I've said it, Warren Buffett has said it, several other people have said it, but for most people, investing in an index fund is most likely the single best investment decision that you could ever make. And you don't have to overthink it. Yeah. You don't have to stress about it. It doesn't require you to have some intense level of, of pedigree. There's no barrier to entry. You don't have to be the smartest man or woman in the room to do it. But if you do it consistently over time, there is tons of research to show that doing that, investing passively, beats people who are actively trying to beat the market on a regular basis. 100%. Is you ready? Mm. I was doing the same. You were doing the beat. Ooh. We're doing them together. Team Saunders. That's not what I wanted. <laughs> <laughs>